John Wooldridge has graciously um, offered to, to give us his program on environmental justice. John, as most of you probably know, is director of the science labs at Flagler. Did I say that correctly? Yeah, the science yeah that's right. Is there a more formal name to that? No, no, I'm the lab manager um, for the natural sciences at Flagler. Yes, so he, uh, he knows of, of what he will speak today. And uh, this is, this is a, a topic, you, one can't separate environmental justice from racial justice, as we all know. So this is a, <clears throat> this is a near and dear to my heart topic because uh, we, Richard and I, my husband and I are, are avid environmentalists and uh, worried sick about, about the planet. So John, I will let you take it from here. Okay, yeah, I'm still sort of getting my, uh, all my screen set up here. Um, but let's see, okay, back to Zoom and share screen. Now I have to share the right screen, lots of screens here. Be careful what screen you share, John. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so there, do you, so do you guys see my screen? Yeah. 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 Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Um, and there full screen yes right should, should be good um and then okay hopefully this will work all right so environmental justice in saint augustine and um i uh i uh, wanted to start by um telling you sort of why how we got into this um so uh just a little background on on where this presentation came from and then a history of environmental justice, what it is. And then there's a little program I, um, I found uh, to sort of serve as a, a discussion uh, point. Um, and we'll watch, watch bits and pieces of it. I'm gonna truncate it so we have time to talk, but um, we are gonna watch a fair bit of it. Um, and then we'll talk about the environmental burdens in St. Augustine. Um, and we'll do a, a tour on Google Earth of uh, a lot of those, those items. And then um, kind of what do you do about it is a, the next question, right? So um, we'll look at a case study um, in Atlanta about what they're doing about it there. Um, and then we'll also map out the benefits in St. Augustine um, and, uh, and uh, where they're located. And then at any point, if anybody has any comments, whatever, please feel free to interrupt and, um, and uh, or chat or whatever. I don't have an eye on the chat. If someone put something in the chat, so I'll holler and let me know. <laughs> um, so yeah, this, um, I am the, I wear many hats at Flagler. Um, one of them is uh, the science lab manager. The other one is I am the coordinator of the science tutors, um, the science learning lab. And so as the science tutors, we help people and uh, we have a lot of good students that help um, help other help the uh, people in biology and chemistry and help them do their homework and get ready for tests and, and etc. Um, and one of the things we need to do as a, a science tutoring program is promote the tutors and so once a semester so we come up with a, a program um, uh, to, to serve the community and that's what this this, that's where this came from this year. So we were gonna talk about environmental justice in St. Augustine and present it to the, the campus. And while we're there, we're gonna say, hey, come, don't forget about the science tutors, come come, um, see, come, come, come work with us. Um, so I, 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 at first, I, when I started to revise this presentation, I, I started to um, take this stuff out, but then I was like, oh, let's, let's talk a little bit. You guys can see what's going on at Flagler and the science program a little bit. And it kind of relates to the topic as well. So everything, science tutoring and everything, not everything, but science tutoring has been virtual on Zoom. So there's a screen about how to make your Zoom, Zoom appointment with science tutors. Um, and then these are um, some of the people I, I wanted to highlight that we have at Flagler that I want to um, brag about. Um, and uh, we can all be, be proud about them. Um, Emma Wilkinson, she worked on this presentation and um, I would have pulled her in. I would have, I didn't even ask her because exams start today. So I didn't want to um, 
get her. I didn't want to distract her. She, she needs an agent. She's got a lot going on. Um, and uh, so I didn't want to pull her in today, but she, she did um, help come up with the idea and did some of the work on this. Um, and I'll show you some of the work she did earlier. And, and um, you know, she's, she's smarter than me. Um, and um, this summer she's going to be doing a REU, which means a research experience for undergrads. Um, with the Maryland Sea Grant program. She's actually from Chicago and, we, and we're really lucky that she came, came to, to Flagler. Another, another guy I have to highlight is Tyler, who's also from Chicago, ironically or coincidentally. Um, and Tyler is, has been my lab assistant for the past few years and is graduating just now. And Tyler is a little bit of my hero, actually. Um, Tyler is not afraid to fail. Tyler has used up Flagler completely. He has found his limits and then some, and he has, um, he, he uh, I serve on another, I served on another board um, talking about local um, environmental uh, issues and um, sort of a question came up about environmental ethics. And I went to Tyler because Tyler knows more about that stuff than anybody I know, professors or otherwise. Um, he just sort of created this whole He's the guy on campus for environmental ethics. And um, he really, so he's a double major in ethics and um, environmental science, coastal environmental science. And, and what Tyler has learned and what you've all learned is that he needs to pursue the, the ethics for his um, career. Uh, that is my lab assistant. He has, he's prone to storing the acids with the bases and, and things like that. Um, but he, but again, Tyler is not afraid to fail, and he has used it all up here at Flagler. He's, he's as I say, he's my hero. And another one, I, I'm, so I'm getting, there's, there's so many, I'm getting, uh, getting long-winded here, but um, I want to tell you about Kira Ledke, um, who is graduating this semester also, and she's going to start um, a PhD in urban ecology at the University of Kentucky in Ooh. a second, I mean, in the fall. Um, and I'll, I'll show you another screen with her in a second. And then finally, um, Wesley Woodard, I don't have a picture of her, but she, she was probably our best student we've had before Emma came along. I, um, um, and she is now the St. John's County floodplain manager. Um, and she's from South Carolina, but she came here, came to Flagler. She got an internship with St. John's County with the previous floodplain manager. Um, and so what is the floodplain manager? Well, um, if you ever notice on your insurance, um, your flood insurance, that you'll see a discount because of the FEMA program. Um, and the St. John's County floodplain manager or the St. Augustine floodplain manager, make sure that we as a community are doing all the things we can, like education and building codes and making sure every house is built to freeboard plus one foot. Um, to make sure that you get that discount. So it's 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 a um, really important job. Um, so she was the intern, but the floodplain manager left. And um, so she had two months left on the internship and there was no floodplain manager and she just started doing it and she could. Um, she was able to pick it up. She works hard. And then they hired her on full time. She just became the full time um, floodplain manager. Um, and at the same time, she's just started, she's doing a, a environmental engineering degree at University of Florida online. So she's uh, virtually doing that as well. So those are some of the people that uh, I just wanted to let you know that, that we have uh, in the science program at Flagler. Um, and here's another picture of, of Kira. Um, Kira is involved in a lot of stuff, including, um, this is a picture from the St. Augustine record that she organized the Black Lives Matter protest um, downtown on uh, June 10th, this is. And so here's Kira protesting and, and I love it. I love it. If you can see her, her t-shirt, it says nerds two to the power of two ever, nerds forever. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so nerds. she's great. Nerds. And when, um, she, when she told us about um, her PhD uh, work that she's going to be doing, she, she wrote this to us. Um, so I want to make science accessible to everyone and anyone that wants to, I don't want to go 
something that wants to be part of the why behind the natural world. I want children of all backgrounds, ethnicities, and disabilities to be able to pick out a scientist in a textbook and see themselves. Mm -hmm. So we really proud of, of all of them. Um, and the other, other um, so in the Coastal Environmental Science Program, the science program at Flagler, we have about 35 graduates a year, uh, nine full-time faculty and a lab manager. The lab manager is me. Um, my wife, Melissa Southwell, um, is, is one of the faculty as well. Um, so right now we just have the one major. We do have a couple of minors, but we do plan to add a biology major. And we are planning to build a, a STEM building of some sort. Um, and in fact, we have purchased uh, property. The college has the Cohen Financial Building and there's another little building here. So um, this is across from the new Flagler parking garage on Malaga Street. Um, right next to Georgie's Diner. So, and we'll see what that becomes and when, when it happens, uh, all that is, is in the works, but um, how we'll, we're excited about that to say the least. Um, oh, and one more plug um, uh, for Flagler. Uh, we do have these uh, lifelong learning classes and I particularly mentioned this, I just, um, I just pretty much signed on the dotted line. I'm going to be teaching one of these on uh, summer session B. So starting about June 28th on, um, I think I'm going to call it environmental choices in St. Augustine. So if you're interested in some of these issues that we're talking about here today in environmental science uh, based in general, um, and in particular, how it applies to St. Augustine, you can learn more about it. And it's, um, they're really affordable classes. They're like $50 for six weeks um, and uh, I, I hope it'll, I, everyone says it's fun. I think it'll be fun and, and interesting. I've been doing it for years now with in Spanish and I recommend it. these classes are incredible and they're such a value, a great value and a way to connect with Flagler in the, from the community to the school. And so I reiterate what you say, John, and that's exciting about your course. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I didn't know you did that. Um, now everyone says that um, it's 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 a good experience for for everybody. Um, okay, so now <laughs> environmental justice. I got to move it along. Um, so what is environmental justice? Just some some sort of quick back up definitions. Um, the the fair distribution of environmental benefits and burdens. So for example, historically landfills and pollution generating sites are located near disadvantaged people. And that's kind of where the history of the movement is coming from. Okay. Um, and then um, what, uh, what the movement has also come to be, be is that it seeks the, the meaningful involvement of all people in the decision-making process, um, regardless of race, color, or, or anything. Um, that and, and the key the key word there is is meaningful and substantive and important involvement of, of people in the decision making process. And so with that, you can see how this ties into the whole conversation of institutional racism and, and getting um, people disadvantaged people into positions to make decisions and control their their environment and their destiny. Um, the movement really got started as, as a thing in the 80s. Um, there was a um, landfill in Warren County, North Carolina. So it's on the northern um, border of North Carolina um, by Virginia. Um, and there was a, <laughs> a, a, class, a, a classic bad guy story. Um, so there was a um, PCB um, is, you know, bad stuff. Um, and it's made and used in partly in um, like when you make mm -hmm. uh, electrical transformers, you need PCB. Um, but there was a whole lot of excess PCB at this uh, electrical transformer company. And they were like, how are we going to get rid of it? And they're like, oh, oh, well, I don't know. Um, so what they did was they put it on trucks and then they just kind of 
turned the faucet on the trucks and started driving the roads and they dripped it out, leaked it out all around the roads of North Carolina. Um, so the, they got caught and um, anyway, the mm. cleanup created 10,000 trucks of PCB contaminated soil that needed to be disposed of. So where are they gonna do it? Uh, um, they selected a site in Warren County, which is a rural county, predominantly African-American community. Um, and um, the citizens were like, wait, what? Why here? Um, and so they, they formed a, a nonviolent protest to, to stop the, the landfill. And so they you know, laid down in front of the trucks and they, um, there were many arrests. Um, but as these things tend to happen, um, the landfill was created anyway um, after some, some time. Um, and um, the landfill, yeah, it was promised to be a great landfill that wouldn't leak. Well, it did leak. Um, and um, so the, the landfill was a problem. But now since then, the landfill has been detoxified. Um, there's a, a chemical process that you can do. So the PCB now has been still there, but has been neutralized or probably converted to a, a less harmful form. Um, uh, we're in a Zoom meeting. So if anyone is interested in um, reading more, there was a recent article, April 6th, in the Washington Post with a nice photo essay and article about, about this event. So you can check that out. Um, the other uh, point to mention would be Robert Bullard as the, the father of environmental justice. So he really gives um, moves environmental justice from uh, activist to academia. Um, he is a professor. Currently, he's moved around. I think he's at TCU right now. Um, but he um, observed in Houston that all the landfills in Houston, Texas, were located in, um, and this was in the 80s, um, were located in predominantly African-American communities. And even if the African-American community was a, was a middle upper class community, that that's where the landfills were located. So, so race was more important than economic status is what he showed. And in fact, through a long series of, of studies and books, um, Dumping in Dixie, I think is his, probably his most famous. I mean, he showed that of all the factors in the world that you can use pr to predict the location of a la landfill, race is the number one that you could use. Like it's the most telling, it okay. correlates the most strongly with locations of, of landfills. Okay. Um, so looking at race in the city, in our city, and this is St. Augustine, and this is a racial dot map, and it's a little bit hard to see, but um, this is Davis Shores in this area. Here's Lincolnville. Here's West St. Augustine. And I don't know if you can see my cursor, if it's kind of blinking in and out, but um, obviously the, um, well, uh, the, the, the green, the sort of lime green color is our African American households. So um, West Augustine is a, a center of African American people in our town, as well as Lincolnville was this, and this is based on the 2010 census. So um, it's probably less so now, but Lincolnville obviously is historically important to the African American community. So when we look at environmental burdens, one of the things we'll look at is, is which are located in, in the Lincolnville area and the West Augustine area. Um, another look at that, again, um, to orient you, the, the inlet over on the ocean and Davis Shores and then um, downtown St. Augustine and then Lincolnville here. So this is a, a map showing the percentage of households below the quality of life income threshold at $75,000 per year. And um, again, this is a little bit old. This is 2010 census data. So 86, above 86% 86 of people are below that threshold in this area in Lincolnville and the South West St. Augustine area. And then it gets in our town, you know, it gets more affluent as you move towards the the coast. So that's the the background, the lay of the land. Okay, um, 
with that, I'm just going to start this little video. Um, does anyone have anything they want to say or comment or question on before we go into that? John, it, it's you. Thank and you. My, my question is, this is, and these are great slides. What, when, when would, would we expect the 2020 census to give us more current information? Um, I, I, I don't know. I would expect in a year or two. Gotcha. Um, um, it does take some time, I know. But. Yeah, Joy. Uh, often in cost benefit studies, because really, very unfortunately, the value of life is considered based on the income level of an area huh. that there are in these models the lower environmental cost is in poor neighborhoods and until the models are carry equal value for all people it's likely that these decisions will continue to be made yeah, um, I, I will say um, there is now um, an, an environmental justice office at EPA. Um, so I imagine that at the, at the federal level, they are certainly aware of, um, of the issue. Um, and then, so we'll, we'll see what happens going forward on, on that front. John, one, one more thing. Eh? friend of mine when I was working was responsible for, was manager of claims and security for a gas and electric utility. And uh, <clears throat> I asked them what the management would, would value, would spend to prevent a, a fatality uh, because I was building a model. And he wouldn't tell me very wisely <laughs> because he didn't want that to be public knowledge or even private knowledge outside of himself. Uh, but he, I proposed a million dollars and <laughs> His only comment was that's more than it cost us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there's some work to be done for sure. Um, but there, uh, let me play this um, video for you um, and it'll talk a little bit about what the NAACP is doing and um, the West uh, Atlanta Watershed Alliance, and then we'll come back and look a little more at um, St. Augustine. So I'm going to share my screen again um, and hopefully get this right. Does that look right? Except it's muted. I thought that was the wrong control. <laughs> At the crossroads of environmentalism and social justice is a movement that's beginning to catch on. People are often surprised to, to, to hear that the NAACP is working on environmental issues. They often think it's disconnected with our bedrock civil rights agenda. People externally and internally, particularly in the beginning, when I first started to do the work, I did a couple of workshops at our regional gatherings that we have. And the workshop on the agenda was listed as Climate Justice 101. And so people came into the workshop and the first time someone said, wow, Climate Justice 101. And when I saw this, I thought this was going to be about the climate of injustice in the world. <laughs> and so they were really surprised when they found out that it was about climate change. And they said, you know, they really see how it relates to their communities. So it's interesting because a lot of people use different terms. They talk about vulnerable communities or they talk about dis marginalized communities or all these terms. And we 
we want to kind of talk about the exposure, the disproportionate exposure, and we talk in terms of frontline communities. So whether it's coal-fired power plants, which are disproportionately located in low-income communities and communities of color, or oil refineries or um, natural gas operations, they're all tend to be located in communities where there are lower property values and communities where there's less um, where there's less political opposition, which tend to be communities that are politically disenfranchised. So environmental justice focuses on the negative impacts of the decisions that affect our environment on people of color and, and, and poor people. Historically, folks who come from those communities have suffered the most. And because of that, we have to be very sensitive to ensuring that the decisions that we make around our environment do not disproportionately affect them. We definitely have to care about the issues associated with climate change, but we also have to understand that, for example, because of our utilization of cars, that it has created bad air quality. Uh, and, and in particular for communities of color that live in urban areas. And so those communities have a high asthma rate. A lot of what we have to do is really talk about how we need to redefine environmentalism to, to think more inclusively than the traditional perception of the environmental movement, which tends to be on, you know, saving the whales or flora and fauna as opposed to families and, and so forth. And so we really say that we're all a part of the environment, you know, humans, wildlife, uh, and we're all interdependent and we're all part of this ecosystem. I did a talk recently in a, a national park, and when it was being advertised, there were people who were perplexed and people who were actually opposed to having a conversation about environmental justice when they have historically, you know, largely focused on kind of the traditional definition of conservation. And so they were about preserving the park and preserving the trees and preserving the wildlife. And they're very much questioning the integration of human rights into traditional environmentalism. Toxic facilities are disproportionately located in low-income communities and communities of color for a number of reasons. Some people talk about the chicken and egg, whether the facilities are there first and the communities come, or the communities are there and then the facilities built there, and really it's it's both. And so when we talk about toxic facilities, it includes everything from landfills, coal-fired power plants, oil refineries, waste incinerators, even chemical plants, cement plants, you know, manufacturing plants like paper mills. One of the uh, misperceptions is the notion that people can just move. Why don't they just move? Usually those uh, high uh, areas of pollution, in particular those plants, um, are the only form of economic development in those communities. And so they have access to jobs. But also, too, where will they be able to move to? The housing costs are cheaper in those areas, but if they attempted to move into other places, it would be more and more difficult for them to afford to move. And so both of those cause challenges for, for those communities to move away from those uh, toxic areas. Well, it, it has been a challenge in, in encouraging people to connect the dots. Usually when, when people begin to have conversations about environmental injustice, they also have to begin to have conversations about structural racism. But for some communities, it's very difficult to have those conversations because if you begin to have those conversations, you, you have to begin the process also of acknowledging winners and losers and acknowledging your potential privilege in the way that the system has been designed. You know, another real challenge also has been around the way that traditional environmental organizations have worked. Having a collaborative spirit around this conversation is not historically where many of these traditional environmental organizations have started from. The other misperception that I've heard is that people don't assume instantly that that the, that the parents of children that live in those communities want the same things for their kids as other people want for their kids. They want them to have access to good food, good water, good air, and, and they want to have a good job in order to provide those resources for them. And also, the last thing is that there's a perception that people of color don't care about the environment. 
But the challenge is, is that many of us feel like we can't do anything about it, that the issue is too big, that we're just going to continue to accept the way things are. And so it is our responsibility as an organization and others to get people to understand that they do have say so in making their communities better and that if they come together and organize that we can create a better tomorrow for themselves and future generations. Okay, I'll stop stop the share there. Um, so yeah, I think that, that does a good job of laying out the background and um, I know for, for myself, I found it particularly um, interesting that sort of traditional environmental organizations like say the Sierra Club or the Greenpeace um, have not really been friendly to the environmental justice movement that, you know, Greenpeace has traditionally been focused on whales and uh, people in, in, in urban areas. Um, and that so that there's this, this conflict that, that does exist within these, these environmental organizations. Um, so next, whoops, right. Um, I'm going to try to pull up Google Earth. And Don, before you continue, this is Hugh. Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree that not, not only in, in my generation, um, <clears throat> But also in the younger generation, the the, the conscious, the, the our conscious level, acknowledging these challenges, wh whether it has to do um, with racial inequality or with envir environment of, uh, impact on all of us, that it it's a lot different now. Uh, let me just say that in my opinion, it's a lot different now. I think it's. It, it, it has become um, a normal topic of conversation uh, and that there is a, a, a consensus out there <clears throat> that things, are, th things are, are not as good as they need to be and that we have to do something about it. And, and that leads me to the, 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 there should be better connection or better traction um, with uh, environmental injustice because it's happening to the white people um, um, as much as it's happening to black people in my in my sense so I, I am hopeful going forward and this kind of stuff that you're presenting is um, is powerful stuff for me thanks yeah I, I, I agree with that that I think that there and at all levels and certainly in um, the younger generation that we see, you know, they they um, much more aware of of this issue and the the nuances and the complexity of it. Um, I know um, Wesley, the Wesley Woodard, she's the floodplain manager. She is is dealing with that at a practical level on you know every day that she is trying to protect the environment, but also has to um, serve the people here. And, and it's, it's hard, but she, she's, um, she's equipped to, to deal with that. Um, let me share, let's do a little walkthrough of um, our town. And let's see. So, I'm um, sorry, sorry if I give you vertigo or something from, from zipping around, but um, so here is St. Augustine in, in Google Earth and um, zeroing in down on St. Cyprian's church. And, and um, um, uh, that's, that's kind of cool. I got the 3D buildings on. So there it is. Um, there's the commons and uh, the church. Just down the street from St. Cyprian's is, um, keep going down, Riberia Point. Um, and in fact, you can see this image from the point shows the sewage treatment plant and what, and Hailing Park, um, before right. they put in the park, it looks like. 
Um, and uh, that this used to be a, a dump, um, the Riberia dump site. It was, it was stopped use in the 70s or so, but they didn't really get it cleaned up and stabilized until more recently. Um, but one of the, the questions being, where, where does your trash go? Where does your water go um, that goes down the drain? Well, for a while, your trash probably came here. Um, where does the water go that, you, that flushes down the toilet that goes down your sink? Well, it goes through a series of pipes to the sewage treatment plant here, and they treat it through a series of, of tanks and aerations. And then it goes out this pipe, there's a pipe here, it goes right on out into the Matanzas River. So if you're ever boating and such, you can go out there and you can look at the pipe and you can see your water being returned to the environment out there in the Matanzas River. Um, yeah, yeah, that's good. The um, where does the water come from? It was is another interesting question. The water treatment plant is over here, as you probably know, on on West King Street. Um, if you go over towards West St. Augustine, it's over there on a nice little high spot of land. Um, but where does the water really come from? <laughs> um, is it comes from the Floridan aquifer um, about 300 feet down um, from a series of wells that are, I'm gonna zoom out, so north of town, um, up, up here in this, all this, that um, bit of uh, land between US 1 and 95, um, there's a series of wells along uh, access road there that's all owned by the St. John's Water Management District, I believe. And, and that's where the well, the water for, for our town comes from. Um, and May I make a comment there? Yeah. That strip that you just mentioned, uh, if you'll go back to that. When I was on the city commission, uh, we had an issue in, this was um, between 1983 and 1987, that at the upper edge of that particular site you had there, uh, some, there was a, a phosphate mining operation wanting to go in there. Yeah. And so in order to protect our well fields, that, that strip is owned by the city of St. Augustine. Oh, it is. And, okay. and in order to protect our well fields, we bought a certain amount of land on either side of the well fields. Well, my concern about that is that, you know, is that narrow strip of land to protect the well fields sufficient? Uh, because the, the, um, the phosphate operation that's up there uh, recharges the water after the phosphate has been taken out back into the earth and, and there could be cracking down there. It's kind of like the same problem you find with fracking. Right. And so that's why we spent the taxpayers' money. And of course, a lot of people in St. Augustine thought that was just an outrageous thing to do to spend a lot of money to protect the well fields. My, my, my cut on it is I'm glad we did it, but I, I question whether the amount of land we bought really has any uh, appreciable effect on, on protecting the well fields. Well, that's really interesting. And that's why I was really looking forward to doing this is that um, you know, trying to find out more about this story. So thanks for, um, so if anybody has any uh, other historical context there, um, I will note that there is a landfill right up there now as well, the Nine Mile Road landfill, which is mm. um, um, a um, construction landfill. So your trash would not go there. Um, but I, I, I'm not a hydrologist. Um, and I, I think there, there is, people do, there is some care given to um, uh, the siting of these and, and modern landfills would be lined as well. Um, hopefully more successfully than others. Um, you say there could be fracking, so that the-, the, no, the it's, it's not a, well, I guess, I'm not sure that that's called fracking, but well, right cracking, where the yeah. cursor is, if you move to that corner, see that little open, that white spot there right next to US-1? That's the, that was the phosphate, op that's it right there. That's yeah. the phosphate operation. 
Okay, now if you move your cursor from that phosphate operation to the landfill, to the end of our well fields, which is that line, yeah, that's dangerous. I mean, how, with all the growth that's going on, if that, if that dump becomes larger, again, when, when we had this problem, I was concerned about the well fields being compromised because of, of the mining operation. From, from the deep wells that, are, are, um, that we draw our water from. If that thing expands, which in a county that is expanding at the rate that ours is, if that expands, we may have pollution coming from the top and not from the aquifer underneath. So either way, sure. you know, either way, I'm not real satisfied that, that our well fields are protected enough. Yeah. Well, well uh, you know, the rate of development in that particular area and north of the in the, in the county northwest is uh, it's unsustainable um, it, as far as our water resources go and the and the depletion of the aquifer in general. So from the top and the bottom, we're in trouble. Well, we can feel really really good though that a lot of this land is owned by the water management district, so that's good news. Um, and and just a. a most of the, I, again, I'm not a hydrologist, but my understanding is that actually the, the water in the aquifer that we're drawing from is some 300 feet down. Um, and the hydrology is such is that that recharge is actually coming from more north in the state, that it doesn't, the water that rains here does not reach down 300 feet. Um, the geology prevents that. Um, but um, I'm not saying it's impossible, but in general, um, um, and that most of the recharge is happening from the, the northern part of the state, kind of in the Panhandle area almost, um, that that water it, it enters the aquifer there and just kind of flows down the peninsula in that, uh, in that deep aquifer. There are shallow aquifers um, that people use for for irrigation and, and water, or a water source, that would be a concern as well. But um, yeah, I, and um, it is definitely a concern, but uh, um, I don't know, I feel pretty good about our water source compared to like city of Jacksonville's taking water out of the St. John's River. Um, and I, I prefer the aquifer water. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and the landfill is a, is a, is a deal. Um, as I got into this, I was, I've been surprised. There are all sorts of little pockets of garbage around town. Um, <laughs> over, um, over on the island, um, if you go across the 312 bridge, there's an old uh, city dump here. Um, so that, that area to the north of 312, when you cross over, is an old city dump. The St. Augustine Beach dump is nearby as well here. That's, all, that's an old dump that's been, and these are all closed. And, and the dumps were completely unregulated um, until the 70s. Um, so who knows what other pockets of garbage are, are lying around there. Um, and then to, to go back to Riberia Point, and there was um, some controversy a while ago when, when the city was trying to stabilize it, they, they, they kind of bulkheaded it. And apparently this is riprap that was created from um, the, uh, the old temporary Bridge of Lions um, that they destroyed it and, and stabilized the shore. But the actual dumping kind of extended out into the marsh area. And what they did is they... They cleaned up. They they took this dirt, the excess dump that was out in this beyond the, in the marsh area, and they they put it over kind of in West St. Augustine, over in these borrow pits up here. Um, and they were not. They shouldn't. That was a bad decision. Um, they did not have a permit to do that. Um, and I don't know what they ended up doing with it, but they they had to stop that and figure out another another place to put it. I know, by the way, there's another old landfill right over here on, um, um, over in this area as well. So there's garbage, garbage everywhere. Um, 
And yeah, down in um, another landfill, big landfill that's been closed. So all of our, so where does our garbage go now? Who knows? Um, I, I asked the city about it. Um, so it goes to, um, some of it goes to ELS in Bunnell. And what do they do with it? Um, well, right now, the ones, the, the, the Bunnell garbage, they take to further south somewhere um, and they, to a, um, another, I think an incinerator down south, but it probably could change depending on economic conditions. And the city also takes some of their garbage to um, the county transfer station up here. Um, and then that garbage goes to Georgia for incineration, uh, as far as we know. <laughs> so it's really, I mean, it's kind of, um, you know, we, 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 we pay people to take it and then it's out of our, our hands anymore. So the lesson there is what you, can you do um, to help with that issue is consume less, um, that we need to produce less trash by hopefully consuming less. Um, yeah. Incineration means you're burn, the burn, it's burned and goes up to the air as pollution? Yes. Um, okay. Often the, usually the incineration plants are, are waste to energy plants these days um, so that they will, they'll use them as um, generating stations. Um, mm -hmm. And then, and they'll collect the, 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 um, the soot, uh, the, the ash and, and landfill that as well. Um, and, the, and then the, the air pollution is, is, is regulated, um, but yeah, um, so it's... Um, but. John, who, who yeah. is, Ivan Kish, who is legally responsible for any consequential health damage that might ensue, which could actually lead to uh, involuntary manslaughter? Uh, well, that, I'm... That's not a question for me. <laughs> I, that, that is a very lawyer, lawyery question, I would say. Um, one could probably argue many things. Um, but yeah, if, 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 our, if our garbage is being burned by someone in Georgia and there's a problem, are, are we responsible? Um, or is it just the garbage? I don't people? know, but someone is. Yeah. Um, I want to show you the, the power plants um, that serve us. I think they're impressive. I used to work on, on the power side of things um, in a couple of lifetimes ago. So um, here's St. Augustine, and I've gotten a little skewed. Um, sorry, here's St. Augustine. Probably most of our electricity is coming from Palatka, the Seminole power station down here. Um, if you're driving through there, you can see the, the um, coal towers when you go to Palat, I mean, the cooling towers. So that's a big old coal plant down there in Palatka. Um, here's a pile of coal and a conveyor belt, and they've got a couple boilers um, and a lot of smoke, as you can see. <laughs> um, yeah, get perspective. But um, so that's probably where most of our uh, electricity is coming from. Um, it's not necessarily the closest place, but um, that is likely because of um, the other nearby plants are run by JEA. And, and I mean, who knows how power flows across the grid, but I suspect that JEA saves their power for themselves um, and that uh, FPL um, is on Seminole. And so that's probably where our power is, is coming from. Um, to go up to Jacksonville though, the other big power plant is, and there's several, um, but the biggest one is this, the JEA, um, not that one, that's the, the uh, JEA North side, which you can see is if you're going up around on, on um, on the, the bypass around Jacksonville as you cross the big bridge. And um, I don't know the whole story up here actually, but it's, it's a combination plant. It certainly used to be a coal plant and they still can burn coal. Um, 
but they do a lot of natural gas and now and um and they, they can also do other other fuels as well so i think it's a fairly sophisticated plant um there um but uh, i'll and then there's another couple of small natural gas plants um, one right down here in the middle of Jacksonville, the uh, Greenland generating station there. Um, and then, um, sorry if I'm giving you vertigo again. Um, um, this one, uh, that, this is Greenland, another natural gas plant. So, and then, you know, there's the story with natural gas is it's, it's definitely less dirty than coal, um, but also doesn't generate as much power as coal, uh, or at least uh, the scale that we use it. But it's, there's a power plant there as well. Um, I think I'll stop the, the earth tour there. Does anybody have any other questions or comments about that? John, uh, where, have you, where does recycling fit in with all this? And uh, to your knowledge, is are we uh, average, better than average, or below average in, in the St. Augustine area with our recycling efforts? Um, I, I think we're a little bit better than average in St. Augustine in terms of how much of our trash is recycled. Um, I don't know that for a fact, but I mean, I know a couple of years ago they... Um, we went to a bigger recycling can, um, and um, I think that was a good move. Um, uh, our recycling goes to Jacksonville as well, and I, I believe, and I haven't asked, inquired about this lately, but um, so we're not quite, I believe that is part of a, um, a certified recycling program as well. John, uh, this yeah. is Tom Mitchell. Um, are you aware of the uh, lawsuit that the state of New York had against, uh, I believe it was Ohio because of their coal fire uh, uh -huh. power plants? Well, this was, that would have been a while ago, right? Um, that was a while ago. It, it, you were talking about how the air pollution was giving people asthma. I just wanted to say this for this group. They, the coal fire plants in Ohio, the prevailing wind was making acid rain in the Adirondacks and the trees were all dying. They yeah. almost lost the whole Adirondacks Park, which is, you know, bigger than Delaware because, and they, the state of New York had to sue, uh, I believe it was Ohio, just to get them to put scrubbers on their uh, chimneys because right. it, it was killing the whole, uh, the whole uh, ecosystem, ecosystem in upstate New York. Yeah, and, and actually, um, um, that's a success story. That um, I mean, acid rain is still there, but it's much, much better than it used to be. Um, that that, but yeah, the winds would carry the, the big power plants in the mid in the Midwest would carry um, the the sulfuric uh, rain clouds uh, uh, to the um, to our air to the southeast and and the the east. Um, and and I, I worked a little bit on the acid rain program, as I say, in a different life, um, keeping track of emission, helping power plants keep uh, track of emissions and report them to the EPA to make sure everyone was in compliance and, and such. Um, anybody, anybody track in that coal fire plant in Palatka to see where the, the uh, acid is going, if you will, or is it pretty much regulated these days? Oh, it, it's very regulated. Yeah, I mean, their emissions will be very much regulated. Um, and then presumably what does slip through the, um, the yeah, they, they have to account for it is, is it, for sure. <laughs> um, it's a cap and trade program. So they have to, uh, the uh, uh, sort of, a, a, the, there's an allowance of pollution that's allowed in the country per year and the, the power plants can purchase part of those allowances and they can't emit over that um, and on a and that's a that's a pretty good way to do it um, they found um, to control emissions at a, at a in a cost effective way keep it down to a, a manageable level just a little anecdote about the Seminole plant 
uh, in uh, 1977, uh, when that was being considered, uh, the municipalities and the counties had to uh, agree uh, that the power plant could be built there. And uh, they, the county only agreed if there were these monitors throughout St. John's County to check on the acid rain. And the, the biggest concern at the time was the effect on the potato in you know, the mm -hmm. farmers in, in Hastings. But uh, the, the historic preservationists came up with a concern about the acid rain, rain damaging the fort. Yeah. So some, sometimes we have some really interesting arguments in trying to, trying to protect the planet. Yeah. I have That's a question though about the recycling. Yesterday, there was a program uh, uh, on, uh, on Sunday morning, I think it was. There's a new book out called, Can I Recycle This? And that author pointed out that in that little recycle sign that we see on products, there are numbers and the numbers go from one to seven. And according to that author, uh, the only really practical ones to recycle are the ones and twos and that's like b bottle jugs and things like that and that in most places all of the other recycle which are things like um you know the plastic wrappings i get from Publix when i get something from from the deli all of those are are just packaged up and bound up and yeah the, the recycling is a murky, murky topic um, that a lot of it ends up just sort of going to storage, if not landfill, um, waiting for the economics of it to turn around to make it profitable to to recycle those sixes. Um, look, I've got, <laughs> as a lab manager, I need to know the different plastics um, for chemical compatibilities. So I have a chart over here on my wall. It's like six is polystyrene. Um, and uh, what, when is it economical to, to recycle polystyrene? Not so much yet. But how would we find out whether our local recycler just benefits from those first two and simply bundles up the rest of it? I mean, how would we know? How would we find out? I, I mean, um, we could find out who, where we give our recycling to, and then you just have to ask them. But um, I don't know if you beyond that. Um, I believe as I was trying to, I didn't quite get the words out. Um, there are certification programs for recyclers, I believe. And my understanding is that the one we use is certified green recycler, meaning I don't know about that, that there, I mean, I don't, I, I think there's not really a good solution to that, but what you really worry about is that, okay, you, you have a recycler that takes all in the, the recycling and then ships it to a developing country and and it becomes a pile that people or kids just sort of play in or whatever um and um but if, if if it's put in secure storage until such time that the economics are such that we can recycle it that's actually not a terrible outcome um by these by these standards so yeah, not all your recycling gets put into use, that's for sure. But I don't think it gets thrown away and it, it, it just gets sort of stockpiled. Yeah. Uh, John, this is a, a different subject. Could you speak to the lack of uh, sewer in West Augustine, just outside yeah. the city limits and, and septic tanks in general uh, and where they're located in the county? And how that is, how that yeah, let me, is let me, economic. Uh, I was going to cover that. Um, let me share my screen again and um, show you a little bit of that. Um, um, that was part of the plan. Um, so, yeah, West St. Augustine has a lot of um, above ground, has a lot of septic fields. And if you were driving around West Augustine and you see these humps in the ground, that's a that's a septic field. So they are not on the city sewer. Their their waste water does not go to the city sewage treatment plant. Um, and they have these humps because the the water won't drain well, won't perk. Um, so they have to kind of build up above 
ground to create a field into which their their leachate can disseminate. Um, so there is a plan, though, to add um, water, improved water service and sewer service to West St. Augustine, and it's an important topic to to keep in mind. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of good plans out there, though, <laughs> whether this gets done or not, I don't know. But um, so here's a, a map of, I believe this is the current water service in West St. Augustine. So West St. Augustine is not in the city limits, but um, the city does serve them water. Um, and uh, I, I assume because they can make a little money on it. Um, is, is the reason that the water service was extended to West St. Augustine. Um, and also the, this is the, the sewer plan. Um, so the, there's no sewers in West St. Augustine and even in, in parts of the city limits, there's no sewers as well. Um, so there's a plan to include, to add sewers and in fact, I believe I saw that like $400,000 was recently given to work on the project. But, you know, when I dug into it a little bit, um, so this is the plan from 2010. And they thought in 2010, the total cost of the product project to improve the water line and add sewers to West St. Augustine was $23.5 million. So where is that coming from? I have no idea. Um, I assume some sort of state or federal grants are what people are thinking, um, but four hundred thousand dollars is is not is not there. So, I think for this to happen, it's got, it's, it's it's a long way off um, as far as I can see. But um, I don't know the political landscape of this or how it's supposed to be paid for. But yeah, at the 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 water system, the water service is poor over there is even some streets that you can see on, from this map on my cursor is on McLaughlin Street. Um, there's no water line going up and down that street or even um, Duval Street, which is a pretty big street um, connecting uh, West King to like the Salomon Calhoun Center area. There's no water service on that area. So those people would have to be on, on a well as well. Um, so the service is, is poor. The service is poor. Does anyone else have something to add to that? I was uh, just, it was interesting that Lenny Curry and the mayor of Jacksonville, Lenny Curry um, is proposing a gasoline tax to switch people from septic to sewer to, in order to create revenue to, to get people off septic and onto sewer. Um, I, it, it was a surprising, surprising announcement that I heard this weekend but and also that the state apparently forgot that we have a federal grant money coming from the COVID fund the yeah. CARES Act and they don't know what to do with it well this could be uh this could we could sure use some of that to yeah. help people get, get sewer lines and water lines and in, in these poverty stricken areas in our county. I have a little bit of different take on sewers, and I'm the only one that feel, has, is thinking this way. Um, I shouldn't even mention it, but I, I'm, I, I don't you think septic, uh, yeah, um, I think septic tanks might be the future. <laughs> um, because in St. Augustine, in, in, in low-lying areas, one of our problems is, um, how do you get the, the sewers to flow from, from point A to the sewage treatment plant? Um, you don't have the you don't have the topography for the water to flow downhill, and so you've got lift stations to raise the water up so it'll uh, it'll flow downhill the rest of the way. Um, but what happens if the power goes out? Well, they have backup generators. Well, what happens if it, the generator floods and the generator doesn't work or there's failure? The, anyway, the the system in Saint Augustine is all the time. Failing might be put against strongly, but there are leaks and spills all the time in St. Augustine. Um, and to me, it, it just seems like a sort of, um, I don't know, that, that, that it will always need these energy inputs for the system to work. But a septic, a septic tank 
if it were maintained properly. And that's the huge if. Um, they're often they're not. Um, if it, if a septic tank were maintained properly, that maybe that would be a good passive way to control to control sewage waste. And as I say, I have I have said this to several people, professionals and smart people, and they all say I'm crazy. So, but the, take <laughs> take it for what it's worth. <laughs> we got to get people off septic, is what they say. But. I'm trying to think about St. Augustine and, and sea level rise and what do you do with, with this stuff and the sea level rise. Right? Well, when I was a little girl living on Marine Street, I can tell you what we did with it. Yeah. We had tanks that went right off the seawall into the bay and you could see raw sewage going right into the bay. <laughs> so we were at least better than that. I've but, heard that Melinda, and there was, I'm um, talking with a guy here, um, it said that yeah, they used to they used to um, yeah, go down walk down to the river and eat oysters and even though there were like raw sewage they didn't uh. see the sewage pipes but uh, they we, used to do that you know that's an interest this kind of ties in with the racial justice discussion when when we were growing up nobody ate fish but nobody fished off the seawall yeah right. and, and we used to crab as kids we would take a raw bacon and a string and a bucket and, and catch crabs, but you couldn't eat them. You just threw them back. And the only people who ate the fish and the crabs and the oysters from the bay were black people Yeah, because they, they couldn't afford not to, because we knew we couldn't, you, there, I mean, there were no swimming signs and places off in Davis Shores off like near Alligator, I mean, um, Lighthouse Park and because it was so polluted <laughs> and, and you couldn't eat the fish out of the bay. So exactly. And that's the that's the final part of my my presentation. And um, we can just talk about it. Um, um, is, is how do we how do we equitably share environmental benefits like our rivers, like our beaches um, and such? Um, and how do we keep those open for everybody? And even today, you're talking about like a lot of you probably know Ford from around town from our, from Lincolnville like he was talking about how he eats out of eats fishes and Lake Maria Sanchez and eats those fish and he was like I've been doing it all my life and um, so yeah I mean it, it's it, it, when you have a, a population that is depending on the local environment for their well-being um, how do you equitably protect the environment there as well I, I um, so there, there's that. Then there's also the question of parks and where parks are located. Um, and St. Augustine, I gotta say, um, is not a very good park town. Um, and I don't know, I guess that's because the beach is nearby would be my only guess. Like um, St. Augustine doesn't have a parks department, you know? Um, and there's a couple of parks in town, but they're county owned and, and the county tends to neglect the parks in town from my point of view, for as I go around town and see the parks, um, the parks in the city limits are not as well maintained as, as others. Um, so, and, and think back to years in, in, in Jim Crow, so you've got a town with bad parks, a town where the beach access is controlled by segregation and and um, as well as as economic concerns you had Butler Beach as an African-American beach um, but that was about about it so yeah, that was it yeah yeah um, so yeah the 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 but we now we have the beach um, is, is fairly well shared by well it's it's um it's accessible by everybody although i guess it's definitely more of an affluent thing to be able to go to the beach um i'm trying to think if i had any more points i wanted to make but i think we kind of covered everything that i Jen, wanted to make. yeah yeah I'd, I'd like to make a comment you know our study group has been reading books on on racial justice Let's and uh, I've, I've made the comment in the past you know i i am the great granddaughter of slaveholders i grew up under segregation 
and I was a civil rights activist. And all my life I've been asking how could otherwise educated, fair-minded, good people have accepted the way African Americans have been treated in this country since its inception. And so while I look back at my great grandparents and wonder, how could you do this? How could you not see? I asked this group the question on one of our previous sessions, you know, what is it that we are doing today that our grandchildren and our great grandchildren are going to think as reprehensible as slavery and segregation was to my forebears? And this is the answer, John, that I thought everybody on this group would come to. What, what are we doing to keep from fouling this planet any more than we do? And I find myself as guilty uh, as anyone else would be that as uh, an 80 year old woman living alone, you know, I, I consume probably three times as much re recyclable plastic as I do trash. But I drive my car whenever I want to go places. Have I spoken out? Have I, have, was, was I an abolitionist for this fouling of the planet the way there were abolitionists at the time of my forebears to try to tell them how wrong this was? Yeah. You know, we have a moral imperative here that mm -hmm. I believe is as serious as my generation had to deal with segregation. And I'm not sure we're doing a very good job of it. But Sandra. If, um, yeah, one of the exercises um, we do um, with students, usually in environmental science classes, we have them calculate an environmental footprint. Um, uh, I think what she said, um, Sandra, is, is very apt that, that we can, um, yeah, I agree that we, we are having an impact and stuff we take for granted and don't really see um, the impact of. When you eat red meat as opposed to chicken, when you eat chicken as opposed to vegetables, the environmental impact of consuming certain things is much is huge compared to to other things, things that we take for granted, um, but actually do have a big impact. So, if you're interested in, in as I say, um, lowering your consumption really does have a huge impact on these environmental issues. That um, you would then require less energy in, in the entire grid, basically because if people are, are not consuming as much or they're, they're consuming lower on the food chain. Um, and I have one, one more point to make about what, um, and the video, I didn't show the end of the video, which I, I really liked um, because I think it took it in a direction that um, probably you, you, we wouldn't have gotten to otherwise, um, but I want, do wanna make the point. So they, they talk about, um, what they can do about these issues um, in Atlanta, they're looking about it, look, looking into it. And what they're doing is they have um, a natural area and um, an environmental education program. And they really work to get kids from these areas that are impacted by these problems into nature to connect with the environment to go on nature walks, to hug a tree, <laughs> um, to, to, and as they say, that they're trying to establish the connection between people and the environment, to reestablish that connection so that they're more in tune with it and also create leaders for the movement in the future, for people that are gonna be spokesmen for, their, for those communities. Um, and I will say when, when I gave, we did this presentation with Flagler College, the Flagler students really responded to this. <laughs> they were really excited about that, that the opportunity to get, and then they talked about their own experiences, which presumably mostly were not disadvantaged about lack of, of integration with nature, but just getting, um, getting into nature and connected to the environment and seeing the, 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 the world around you 
at that level is, is a way to address environmental injustice because you're creating that connection and you're creating the leaders for the next generation. Can I ask, <clears throat> when you talk to your students and mention Earth Day, do they have kind of like a dumb look on their face and say, well, what, oh, no. what, what exactly was that? You know, it seems like uh, though we celebrate it, it seems like uh, we celebrate it once a year. We give it a day, and that's the end of it. What What are their response? The reason I mentioned that too We've is that many of many of us were around, and we were advocates for Earth Day way back in what was it, 1970. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how how does that impact on your students? No, Earth Day is a big deal. Um, I think uh, people are very aware of Earth Day, um, and in general, I, I mean, the 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 students are are um, they're <laughs> they're just inclined to be at least the students we have are inclined to be very much environmentally conscious, um, and I think that's across across the board at, at Flagler. I'm comfortable saying, and certainly in our department, an environmental science department. Um, that's absolutely true that we, I learned um, the students are putting us to shame. Um, so my other lab assistant last year was talking about this service she uses to, to um, buy only recycled um, goods. I was, I was bragging about how I've stopped using uh, sandwich bags and I use only Tupperware. And she was like, oh, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Um, but but we, we mail order all our toilet paper and all this from, from this uh, sustainable producer and, um, and uh, such. So anyway, yeah, no, I, I think, um, no, I, I, I think there, it, Earth Day is, is definitely still a thing. <laughs> Well, go ahead. Was there somebody who was going to speak? I was just going to say I received a jacket in the mail from my, one of my daughters that was from Nordstrom. It was just happened to be on sale for $25 and had been a hundred a down puppy jacket. And the whole thing is made from recyclable like plastic bottles. And I mean, yeah. it looks like a normal down jacket, but I mean, there is, there is, there are some glimmers of hope um out there but boy do we have a long way to go especially when the state i don't want to be too political about this but, but i can't help it when the state is is telling local uh, municipalities or, or counties that they can't do certain things that they want to do they're environmentally um sane like banning plastic straws and banning, banning plastic takeout containers and that sort of thing so it, it's, a, it's an uphill battle, but I think we have made some progress. But the question, this is too depressing to say, but, it, you know, are we past the tipping? Has the tipping point already been reached? I don't know. No. Um, well, I would say that, you know, I mean, a certain tipping point has been reached, but it can get a lot worse, I would say. Oh, well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it will get worse before it gets better. But I, I, I think I think there's um, I would say that uh, yeah we can we can change our our um, patterns and make a big difference in the, our quality of our future future life. Yeah. Well, John, do you do you have anything more to say to wrap this up, or does and does anyone else have any comments? No, I've said my piece, um, and I think you guys, um, yes. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much. This is, it, it, I mean, it, it, it can't be a more timely topic. And Sandra, what you said, uh, I think really put the icing on the cake because this, we're, we're in a literally sink or swim moment in our existence. And I think it, it behooves us all to, to connect environmental justice with racial justice ju and social justice in general. And so thank you, John, for opening our eyes and giving us lots to think about and for all the good work that you are doing and your students are doing. And I'm really proud of Flagler for its environmental science um, program and, and 
the expansion that the, the, the department is, is looking at. So kudos to all of you. I'm Great gonna, presentation, I'm, John. Thank yeah. you. I'm going to enroll in adult education, John. And John, right. John so sign up for John's class. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not sure which class, but I'm, I'm enrolling. Enroll. <laughs> they, they said we're not allowed to give uh, homework or tests. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, really, y'all, seriously, there's so many wonderful, wonderful adult and continuing ed education. I can't talk. Adult and continuing education classes offered. You just go to the Flagler College website and then. You can go to adult continuing education and you go to their catalog and you can look at all the different courses that are offered. And is the, is the um, summer mid summer term up yet? Yeah. Okay. Summer A is up, which I, I guess. I know summer, starts a, in, yeah. summer A, in, a, a is yeah, yeah. already people are enrolled and you're doing summer B. That's the plan. Yeah. And is, and is that course catalog up too? No, okay. no, no, nope, it's not. Okay. So if you're waiting for John, <laughs> we'll wait for you to tell us when it, I'll know when it's up and I'll tell everybody. But yeah, um, yeah. so I'm glad you're doing that. That's wonderful. That, yeah, I'm excited. I think it'll be fun. And Lucy, who's, she's disappeared from the screen, but oh, there she oh, is. No, there she is. It's my eye. It's my eyes. Um, <laughs> she's taken a lot of photography classes at, in the continuing ed. And I don't know if anybody else here has either, but taken anything. But it, it's a great, you have, Tom? Yeah, we oh, took sign it. language. Very nice. Good. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, thank you so much, John. It's been very enlightening. And, and uh, let's all try to do our parts. And so less. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Y'all have a bye -bye. great week.